Welcome back to Municipal Matters here on your TV. I'm your host, York Bellsmith, and we are joined now by Chief Dave Mowat of Alderville First Nation. Uh, Dave, thank you very much for, for taking the time to have a chat. What I'm really hoping uh, is a, a time of change. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, York, and uh, uh, for having me here. It's, um, it's been a heavy duty week and a half, or week, about a week and a half, I guess. It's been pretty heavy. Last week was very, um, heavy duty with we had a couple of deaths uh, of members uh, but we also uh, were dealing with um, the fallout from the Kamloops uh, Indian Industrial or Indian Residential School and um, I was getting a uh, phone calls messages letters so um, yes uh, pretty pretty heavy duty week what was your uh, initial reaction when when you heard the news um, well um, it wasn't really one of a sh uh, sh shock or surprise. Um, some of us who have worked uh, around this issue uh, uh, had a sense that this was a fact, actually. I think a lot of people just said, see, I told you so. And this was the proof that uh, some of the oral tradition was right, was correct. Um, and so uh, I do remember coming across uh, documentation from British Columbia on uh, the residential school issue that did suggest that this had occurred. So <clears throat> I have to be honest to say that uh, I wasn't surprised. Um, I think that it was just a matter of time um, before technology became advanced to the point where it could determine that this was actually a fact. And I don't think anybody would be surprised that there will be there will be more. How do, how are you confident at all in, in in the government's response so far about further searches, or do you think that's something maybe First Nations are going to have to take on themselves? Um, I, I believe that the First Nations would need to uh, put up, put the pressure on and uh, and uh, make uh, advances to do this themselves, um, as we have seen throughout time. Um, the government doesn't move too slow on issues, especially when it knows it might be getting back into a corner. Um, and so uh, I think it should, uh, I think that those First Nations that believe um, that there may be hidden graves or unmarked graves or mass graves, what have you, I think that they should just, you know, um, pursue this uh, as best they can and seek resources where they can the technology is now available we know that and so uh, i uh, i believe that it's going to be the first nations that keep pushing on this we talked i talked with uh, with chief Lori carr uh from from hiawatha first nations and she mentioned the word allies a lot and talking about those non-indigenous that are our supporters how important uh is that do you believe to to searches continuing to maybe the federal government or the catholic church taking accountability um, well, uh, last week, uh, I, uh, again, speaking of alliances and allies, um, you know, I was driving, uh, I was, I had to take a drive on Sunday and I was uh, quite, um, um, not surprised, but I guess moved um, by all of the flags that I saw at half mast, didn't matter where it was, businesses, um, uh, you know, the the Big Apple down there near Colburn and uh, just, you know, everywhere. And I even, I even saw um, an orange uh, t-shirt hanging off of a farmer's fence. And uh, I've never seen that before. And, um, and so I think this was a turning point in, in helping to build those allies and alliances. Um, as far as um, the Catholic Church goes, um, we're going to see pushback. I'm, I'm certain that we'll see pushback. And the Pope was uh, um, com uh, <clears throat> quoted as not being too uh, <clears throat> definitive in his remarks. Of course, that's really that's no surprise. Um, <clears throat> but I think that uh, building those alliances within the public realm is going to be important to keep exerting pressure on, on government and on the church. 
it certainly has opened up a conversation. And again, I was, I drove up, I saw you on, on Friday and in my drive, I was noticing the, the, the exact same thing. And I think I know where you saw the orange shirt as well. If not, there's more. Uh -huh. uh, how does that, how does that affect your optimism that things can actually really significantly change? Um, well, you know, I, I was in a, um, I was in an interview last week and I did say that, um, you know, society is quite fickle um, when it comes to atrocity or, um, you know, world events, what have you. Um, society can get upset and then the pressure drops and then it's on to the next issue. Um, and that's, you know, that's the way it is. Uh, so it's going to take, I think, a concerted effort on the part of the First Nations on the part of our provincial, our, our uh, PTOs, um, our territorial organizations, on the part of the Assembly of First Nations, um, to maintain that pressure, and uh, I think too that if if Canadians are sincere in their um, um, in their you know um, shock and horror, that they should start writing and sending messages to their members of Parliament, um, and I would uh, urge them to do that now right now and keep that pressure keep that pressure moving keep it going on um, because uh, we know that if we let up that uh, that the government uh, they take advantage of that when people let up on things so I, I would I, I would cur encourage you know our, our allies uh, people living in the urban areas um, indigenous and or not indigenous to start writing those letters to the respective churches uh, and or definitely members of parliament. Our member of parliament, Philip Lawrence, uh, uh, I was in a, a scrum uh, with uh, the mayors of the uh, county on Friday and, and David Pacini and, and Philip Lawrence were also in the audience and uh, Philip committed to, uh, you know, um, making the residential school issue uh, um, one of primary concern for him. So <clears throat> now is the time and harness, harness the energy and and uh, let's uh, keep exerting the pressure. There were so many residential schools across the country uh, and with more uh, hopefully being searched. I, I, don't, I, I don't know that this is gonna go away and, and that's not necessarily a, a bad thing. And it's gonna keep people enraged and wanting change. Yeah, you know, I, uh, <clears throat> I have a colleague at Queen's University and him and I were talking a few days ago and um, he, uh, he's from Chapleau and uh, he talks about um, sort of the local oral tradition about um, <clears throat> unmarked graves in that area. <clears throat> and uh, excuse me. And um, and so you know he just talked about that, and he's mentioned it to to me before actually. <clears throat> um, and um, I I, uh, I believe wholeheartedly that uh, we're just scratching the surface. This is a totally new chapter. Um, this is the unwritten chapter of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And, um, and uh, um, just locally, uh, I should say, uh, I was in touch with another uh, a professor at Queen's University in the last couple of days. And um, you know that we, uh, Alderville is the site of a former industrial school that was built in 1849, predecessor to the residential school. Um, but next door to me here is our old church built in 1870. And we have, um, there's a sort of an oral tradition here that there, there's unmarked graves behind our church. So I've contacted this professor and he's gonna provide us with a, a research team to come up and do some GPR work behind our church and or wherever we desire him to, to search. Um, and so I had sent him our GPR report from 1997. And he said to me, well, that's helpful, but it's not completely useful because of the advances in technology. And so, uh, again, I think that we're just seeing, this, we just scratched the surface here. Do you know when you expect that to happen? Um, he's actually just in the midst of getting his, uh, he's actually going to be sending his students here. Um, and um, I'm, he's, he's working on scheduling right now. So I, I'm, I'm thinking that it's going to be probably within the next month. Um, and then we'll, Again, he was showing me some of the examples that he's done in Portland, um, in other areas of Canada and the United States. And um, 
and he was just uh, explaining how far advanced the technology is. So I'm really looking forward to being able, able to to, uh, to accomplish this. The the primary reason is um, we don't want to be doing anything behind our church and disturb anything back there. So that's the primary reason. But just um, where I'm sitting actually right now is the general location of the old industrial school. And uh, I've never heard of uh, burials around the industrial school. Um, but again, he can incorporate the area around our band office into the into the search as well. Right. That's going to be interesting to, to, to find out. And, and I, I, I like that he's sending his students up. What an education, a learning exactly. experience it, it, it is going to be for them. And that's really, really important. Because And one thing, too, I don't think a lot of people realize this. We're not talking so much about ancient history. The last residential school closed in 1996. Yes. Yes, it's, um, um, it's uh, recent, recent history. Um, <clears throat> the... Uh, the residential school system um, came comes about uh, on a historical continuum, a sort of a timeline. Um, I always point this out in presentations that um, the the Alderville Industrial School, which was born out of the minds of uh, those uh, <clears throat> fellows that sat on the Bagot Commission, uh, 1842 to 44, the uh, industrial school plan comes out of that commission, and it's probably. The, the first royal commission on uh, indigenous peoples in, in the former colonies. Um, and um, <clears throat> so the Oliverville Industrial School and, and Muncie over in Muncie Town near London, that was also uh, came out of the Bagot Commission. And so the school was built in 1849. Um, and it was, um, um, it would, you know, it was built to advance the assimilationist agenda. But the important thing to remember is that it was pre-confederation. So our people had de facto self-governing authority. They also agreed, those communities and chiefs who agreed to send their children here also would provide 25% of their treaty annuity money to help support the school. So when their children, when, when signs showed that the children might be losing touch of the language or, um, or you know, what they felt they didn't like in what the school was accomplishing. Um, they had the power in the 1850s, they had the authority to really bring that school to an end, bring that school plan to an end. If we advance to confederation and then post confederation, that is where we see the, what I call and what's been called before the uh, coercive power of the law. Uh, that is when we see um, Section 9124 of the uh, the BNA Act, and then the Indian Act in 1876. That those are the legislative mechanisms and tools that were used to usurp the authority, the de facto self-governing authority of the First Nations people. And so, therefore, by 1883, it was uh, uh, <clears throat> the, the the residential school uh, plan and the the law around the residential schools was based in Canadian law and the, and the rule of law. It became the law to send children to these schools, unlike the 1850s, pre-Confederation. That's an important thing to remember about Alderville. And that's one of the reasons Alderville failed. What created change? What, what created the closing and, and the change in, in, in the residential schools by 1996? Was there, was there something that happened? Was there a public outcry? Well, um, if you just, uh, for, for one thing, 18, 1982 is an important year because that's when we see Section 35 incorporated into the, into the, uh, the, the, the repatriation of the Constitution. So Section 35, um, uh, all uh, treaty and Aboriginal rights are hereby affirmed. Um, and so that changes the course of history for First Nations and, and um, you know, and Métis and Inuit as well. Uh, that changes the course of history. And then um, out of the 80s and 90s, we, um, the Royal Canadian on, on Aboriginal Peoples, OCA, 1990, uh, you know, that, that was a, a difficult time. Um, I remember being in Alderville that, uh, during that summer, and I know what it did to the First Nations. I know how it sort of turned our First Nations inside out. Um, 
And then we have the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples from 1991 to 1996. So it was in the mid nineties that things started to get revealed and really start to, to um, uh, Canada was, you know, under Mulroney then, um, Canada um, started to learn about uh, what actually was occurring at the First Nation level. And it was through, um, I was in Winnipeg and University at that time, some sometime around there, uh, during those um, hearings that came to Winnipeg. And, um, and so I, I, I would say it was the 1990s that really starts sort of the process of education, new education and new knowledge that is revealed. Um, and then, you know, uh, 1996 actually was the year in which Indigenous Peoples Day was enacted uh, by the Governor General. So the 1990s was definitely a watershed decade. I could literally talk to you for hours about this. There's, <laughs> there's so much, we're almost out of time. You did mention uh, uh, Indigenous Day. National Indigenous Month is the month of June. What does that mean to you? Well, it's the uh, summer solstice and a period of, you know, rejuvenation and um, um, new, newfound strength. And uh, it's an important time for us. Um, and uh, it's a strawberry moon too. Strawberries will be coming up. Um, uh, you know, important time um, um, all across the land, um, June 21st being what it is, again, the summer solstice. Um, it's um, a time of uh, important reflection. It's going to be an interesting time this year. It's going to be very, very interesting to see how the, um, how the nation um, views Indigenous Peoples Day this year. It's going to be, I think it's going to be unlike others that we've seen in the past. Um, but it's a very important time of year. We're actually going to be in Kingston that day. Uh, Alderville is going to be represented. I'll be down in Kingston that day. We're, we're unveiling a, a large uh, public art uh, installation uh, at Lake Ontario Park in Kingston, um, commemorating our history in the Kingston and Bay of Quinty area. So an important month uh, and definitely uh, a year that we'll never, we'll never forget. Uh, yes, yes, ab absolutely. And there's still more that we are we are going to be learning. Uh, and this is a very important month, I think, too, for uh, for non indigenous to take the opportunity to learn about the history. And you're a great person to talk to about that, uh, about that, no doubt. Uh, and I, I, I just I, I want to pass along our sympathies from all of us here uh, to the Alderville community for the, the two recent losses, uh, just people I knew personally and uh, and it's a, it's a big loss and it, it is a big loss and uh, we, we celebrate their life. And I just want to remind you something your wife said to me when I was up at your place on Friday uh, about the 215, she said those 215 spirits that were released are now around the globe yeah. and guiding. And that's, yes. that, that's huge, I think. And indeed, literally around the globe, uh, you know, news, news uh, papers picked this up everywhere, China, you name it, all over the globe. So this is uh, uh, hopefully, this um, changes history, changes Canadian history moving forward. I sure yeah. hope it does. Exactly. You know, the, I just put a quick shout out to the mayor of Brighton. I was, he was just, he just was here about uh, 25 minutes ago or so. He picked up a couple of flags that he's going to fly on, on June 21st in, uh, at, down at Brighton. So I was pretty, pretty proud of that. Mine's up in my backyard. Yeah, I, you betcha. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thank you very, very much. And I certainly look forward to uh, talking to you again.